I was reading a piece recently where the writer was showing some scorn for what she took to be the traditional account of the Buddha's awakening. Here he was, a child of privilege, and he comes away with the truth, there, there is suffering. Now, if that's all he had to say on the topic of suffering, that might have been deserving of scorn, but he had a lot more to say. In particular, he said suffering, the noble truth of suffering is that suffering is clinging, clinging to the five aggregates. Now, clinging is something you do, and this is nothing obvious. We tend to think that we suffer because of things outside, the actions of other people, or pains in the body. But the Buddha is saying, no, the real suffering that weighs down the mind is the way we cling to things. And particularly, we cling to the aggregates. And the aggregates are tools of processing experience. So we cling to certain ways of processing our experiences, and that's why we suffer. Now, we also discovered that we do that because of our craving. But craving is something that we can abandon, which means that we can put an end to suffering. And of course, then there's a path, and the path is to really comprehend that craving, and to put us in a position where we can comprehend it and see where we're doing things wrong. So the whole practice is reflecting on yourself, reflecting on your actions. And the Buddha gives you three things to do. There's virtue, there's concentration, and discernment. Virtue gets you started by reflecting on your actions. You start thinking about the things you ordinarily might do and feel perfectly justified. Sometimes you feel that killing animals is justified. Sometimes you feel that lying is justified. Even times when you can take something without its being given, and some people can justify that. The Buddha is saying, no, you've got to reflect on your actions. The impulse to break the precepts is something you have to hold in check. And you have to keep those precepts in mind and be alert to what you're actually doing, to make sure they follow the precepts. This gives you training in mindfulness and alertness, which are the skills you're going to need for concentration. You have to keep one object in mind, like the breath. And then you have to observe how it's going. Is it comfortable? Is it not? How can you breathe in a way that gives rise to a sense of well-being, a sense of fullness inside? How can you maximize that sense of fullness? You have to watch yourself in action. Remember the Buddha's analogy when he first taught Rahula. The first image he gave him was of a mirror. You look into your actions as a mirror to reflect on the purity of your mind. And so in the same way, virtue is a mirror, concentration is a mirror, and ultimately, of course, discernment is a mirror. It teaches you how to relate to your thoughts. both thoughts that occur in the context of the concentration and thoughts that occur outside. You want to be able to step back, not get taken up by what you think is true, but simply to see when you say something is true, how is the mind reacting to it? How is, what is the mind's intention behind that claim of truth? And what holds on to that particular truth, what does it do to the mind? What does it inspire you to do? So you have to learn how to be reflective. Otherwise, the insights that come during concentration can lead you astray. I know several of Ajahn Fuang's students who tended to get psychic abilities while they were meditating, and they didn't reflect. They just believed, believed everything that came in. 
It's like believing everything that comes in on your TV. And they didn't reflect. I know one case where this one woman was convinced that one of the monks at the monastery was having an affair. And every time she claimed to have seen him with this other person, with, the, with this nun actually, there, was, there were lots of witnesses that know the nun wasn't there. Or if the nun was there, he wasn't there. That she would not be swayed from her conviction that there was something going on and that she had actually seen these things. That's a case of not being reflective at all. Because she basically wanted to get rid of the monk. This is what it came down to. And so whatever comes up in the meditation, you've got to reflect. What in the mind leads to this conclusion? And if I accept this conclusion, where is it going to lead me? Think of the Buddha getting on the right path. You have to realize that the austerities were not working. He decided to get his, divide his thoughts into two sorts. Those that were motivated by sensuality, ill will, cruelty were on one side. Those who were motivated by renunciation, non-ill will, and non-cruelty were on the other side. And so again, he was looking at what motivated the thought. And the reason the motivation was important was because that was going to bend the mind, as he said, to do certain things. So you've got to look. When a thought comes up, how are you breathing around the thought? That's form. How are you feeling about the thought? That's feeling. What are the perceptions that go into it? What are the ways you're talking to yourself about it? In other words, all these aggregates are right there, and you want to see how you're clinging to them and how you're creating suffering. Now, when we talk about suffering coming from within, it's not like we're letting everybody else outside off the hook. After all, they have their karma, and if they really are, do have bad intentions, that's going to be their karma. But our purpose here is not to settle affairs outside, it's to look at how we're weighing our own minds down. Because that's the only way out. Otherwise, we stay entangled in the affairs of the world, and those affairs have no end. Of course, we learn how to pull out, step back from our thoughts, step back from our convictions, and look at them, see where they're coming from, where they're going. There are certain things that you do hold on to as part of the path because they take you to a good place. But you have to sort them out. Which thoughts coming up in the mind are motivated by your defilements, which ones are motivated by lack of defilement. That's the work of discernment, to see which is which. So this requires a lot of us. I know all too many people who believe that whatever comes up in a meditative mind must be accepted, must be true. I know a lot of people who believe that whatever comes up in their mind is just totally motivated by defilement. Neither case is true. Lots of different things are going on in the mind. You have to learn how to sort things out as to what is skillful and what is not. This is the work of that factor of awakening called analysis of qualities. So discernment does require work. It does require us to be discerning, to see the distinction between what's skillful and what's not, and to particularly be very sensitive to what we're actually doing. This is why Kiyananda Yono would always say when an insight comes up in the meditation, always wait to see what happens right after the insight. What mental state follows on it. That's what the real insight's going to be. So you look at your thoughts, not so much in terms of their content, and for the time being, as you're meditating particularly, whether they're true or not, ask yourself, well, what do they do? 
How do they perform? Remember, this is a teaching on karma. And remember the Buddha's awakening. Those first two knowledges he got, one was knowledge of past lifetimes, the other was knowledge of all beings in the universe. Those were not the complete awakening. The complete awakening is when he looked at his mind as it responded to those knowledges. What was going on in his mind? And he saw what there was clinging and craving. Okay, there's going to be suffering. Even around knowledge like that. So step back, look at the processes of the mind. Because that's where the real issues are. Where the causes of suffering are, where the suffering is. But also the potential for putting an end to suffering comes from watching these things and seeing them in action. And becoming very discerning in how you shape your experience, how you react to your thoughts. So reflect. Remember, this practice is a mirror. It's not for looking outside, it's for looking at yourself. I'm trying to be very precise to figure out which things going on in the mind are part of the path and which things are off the path. That's what the Buddha discovered. No one else had discovered it before him. And it's up to us to take his discovery and make the best use of it. <laughs>